Are you ready? I hope you're ready. Here we go. Shang Jiao Chin Han, Shang Jiao Chin Han, Sui Tang Song, Sui Tang Song, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong. You need to know this song by memory. So, here we have Ah, the wonderful Chinese dynasties color coordinated just for you. So, what do we have at the top? We have Unit 1, Time Period 1, Foundations Era, the Shang and the Zhao dynasties. We have the Qin and the Han, which are the classical era dynasties. The Sui, the Tang, the Song, the Yuang, the Ming, all of those are the dynasties during the post-classical era. The Ming dynasty will begin the early modern era, time period four, and it's gonna end with the Qing. The Qing is gonna run throughout all the modern era, time period five. They're gonna end at the start of time period six and get replaced by a republic government and eventually replaced by a communist government under the chairman Mao Zedong. So you need to know the history of China through the dynasties. You need to know which dynasties came in what order. You need to memorize that song and sing it in your brain over and over and over until you know it all. So we're gonna focus over here. Time period five, the modern era, Qing dynasty of China. And there we have the Qing dynasty, the largest dynasty of them all, controlling most of what we now call modern day China. So the, Qing, the Qing dynasty is going to face a lot of problems by the early 1800s. A lot of internal problems and later on a lot of external problems to make things worse. So one of the problems is that China's populations continues to grow faster than anyone else's and that puts a lot of strain on the resources and the agricultural productivity, food supply, in other words, of China. So uh, the pop they essentially they have overpopulation by the 1800s where the population surpasses their amount of food production. Uh, so that means there's going to be a lot of limited resources, which means there's going to be a lot of fighting and conflicts and rebellions throughout the 1800s. To make matters worse, we're going to see increased corruption of the Qing government, where the Qing emperors lock themselves away in the forbidden city, right in that palace complex, uh, in the center of Beijing, the capital, uh, where they hand off the responsibility of running the government to the Mandarin bureaucrats and uh, eunuchs, uh, while the emperors live in, you know, a life of uh, fantasy and luxury, which leads to a lot of government corruption. So we have all these internal issues. People are angry. People are depressed people are starving then you have the government that's not doing its best to fix these problems and you have the economy slowly weaken especially after um you know especially after having that inflation economic collapse right back in the 1700s right when we talked about how they imported so much silver that their economy collapsed because of inflation so these are all the problems the Qing dynasty is facing. And of course, what is going to be the response? They're going to be rebellions, left and right. Lots of rebellions. And there's going to be a quite a bit of famine as well. And all of these political instability and lack of resources and famines is going to push. It is a push factor, pushing many Chinese, millions of Chinese to leave China and sail across the Pacific and make their way to the Americas. Many of them are going to reach, you know, the western coast of the United States in like California, and they're going to work on the railroads. Some of them are going to make their way to 
Central America and Mexico. Some of them are going to make their way to the Caribbean and Cuba. Many of them are going to go into, um, you know, places like Brazil and Peru, right? Where they're going to work in agricultural fields. So, and a lot of these guys are actually going to come as indentured servants, right? Because they're too poor to afford that trip. So they have to sign away a contract saying, I'll work for five, seven years, five to seven years, and then I'll gain my freedom. All right, so indentured servitude is going to continue. But now instead of having Europeans as indentured servitudes, servants will have the Chinese. So let's talk about problems. The first problem we're going to see is going to be the opium wars, because there's two of them. And here we see a photograph, because by the 1800s, we see photography as a technology. Here we see a photograph of two Chinese men who are addicted to opium. Opium is a drug, very similar to heroin, a very addictive drug. So let's talk about how this happened. Well, it's all the British responsibility, actually. So remember in the 1600s, 1700s, how the Qing government had closed off its borders, closed off its ports, except one or two, uh, put restrictions on the Europeans, telling the Europeans that if you wanted to trade with China, you had to accept the restrictions and bow down and perform the kowtow to the emperor. Well, a lot of the Europeans did it, but of course the British did not. And by the 1800s, the British come back and say, we want unrestricted trade. It is not fair. It is not right that China is blocking itself out from world trade. There should be free trade. Everyone should be able to trade. There shouldn't be any restrictions. And the king of, of the queen at the time, Queen Victoria of Britain, sends a letter saying to the emperor of China, uh, open up your borders. Come on, let's trade. And the emperor replies, nope, there's nothing we need from you. There's nothing we want from you. Um, so, no. So what the British are doing is that they are going to start importing heroin. I mean, opium, I mean. And opium is grown in places like India and places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, right? Territories that the British will have increasing control over. They're going to be British colonies. So the British are going to produce opium uh, and then smuggle it illegally into China. And the Chinese are going to buy it and they're going to be addicted to it. And they're going to buy it and buy it and buy it. So all that silver currency that the Chinese have been uh, collecting now is going to make their way into the pockets of the British. And the British are going to grow more wealthy. And then those, as more and more people are making money off of this illegal drug trade, because um, the British are essentially selling drugs to the Chinese, uh, like the local rulers of the cities of the ports are going to be more open to allow the British to come in and trade more. So the Qing dynasty, even though they're saying the British can't come in, uh, they don't have the power, the centralized power to enforce those rules. So the British are going to come in more and more. They're going to bring in more and more drugs because that's what the Chinese want. And little by little, the Chinese are going to lose money. And what do the British want? They want tea, they want silk, they want porcelain, they want luxury goods, but especially tea. Europe becomes this super, you know, they become addicted to tea. Uh, and they want to drink it out of nice little porcelain cups and wear nice silk clothing. And all these luxury goods, of course, coming from China. So the British are going to be, you know, you know, trading illegally, trading drugs. Uh, the Chinese say, okay, the Qin Dynasty says, you know what, we're tired of this. We've asked, they actually even send a letter saying, please stop selling drugs to our people. And the British kind of just ignore it. Uh, so the Qing Dynasty says, all right, enough is enough. Uh, then they go down to the port cities where the British are trading. They confiscate uh, the drugs. They imprison all the British smuggling, you know, drug dealers, basically, the smugglers, uh, and they um, throw them in prison, and Britain says, free them, uh, or, and give back their property, or else, and then the Chinese say, you know, we're not going to free them up, you know, you're invading our, 
our sovereignty you're invading our territory uh and then they go to war and china loses horribly because china didn't had not developed the firepower the industrial capacity to wage war that britain had so britain sends its navy the world's most powerful navy at the time right these steel ships steel uh steamships that have massive guns right they're called gunboats and they go up and down the grand canal up and down the chinese rivers and they just bombard the crap out of chinese cities force them to submit and China is forced to give up. They lose. And they try again in another opium war and they lose again. And each time they lose, they're forced to give up territory uh, to the British. And then the French come in and say, give us territory or else. And then the Chinese have to give it up. And then the Germans come in and the Russians come in and the Japanese come in. And they all tell the Chinese, give us territory or else. And the Chinese have no choice. Now, the Qing Dynasty had shown itself to be kind of like pathetic. It can't even defend its own territory. So we see a movement amongst the people uh, led by this guy. Uh, his name is Hong Shangju, something like that. And Hong is a Christian convert. He converts to Christianity. And he believes that he is the brother of Jesus who has been reincarnated and he believes that he is going to overthrow the Qing dynasty because it is obvious that the Qing dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven and he is going to overthrow that dynasty uh, and replace it with a new dynasty a Christian dynasty so he leads a rebellion and they become known as the Taipings and the Taipings go to war against the Qing dynasty and they fight for about 10 12 years 13 years and they f it's a super destructive civil war basically 20 million people die at the end of this war and the Qing dynasty barely survives they barely survive and the only reason the Qing Dynasty remains power is because they ask Europeans and Westerners for help to help put on the rebellion. And just like how the Ming Dynasty had asked the Manchus to come help them, the Qing now are asking the Europeans to come help them, and the Europeans are going to want a big payoff. So let's talk about what they want they're gonna want spheres of influence so if you look at this map you'll notice that China has all these different colors and each one of these colors means that they are territories under the influence of a foreign power so we have Germany we have Russia we have Japan right we have uh, Britain and we have France and all these countries, basically, these are not necessarily like colonies where they control it directly, but they run the show in these territories. So even though the capital is right there, that's Beijing, and even though the Qing dynasty is still running China, all these coastal areas, all the ports, belong to foreign powers and these are what we call these spheres of influence and the chinese people living there you know have to pay tribute have to pay taxes to these foreigners and all the trade that was taking on in these ports were to the benefit of the foreigners not beneficial to the chinese people so if you look at this political cartoon we see how china which is kind of like this big pie, this big pizza, is being carved up, right? We have the Japanese, we have the Germans, we have the French, we have the British, we even have the Americans in there, all right? And the poor Qing dynasty guy in the background, he's, there's nothing you can do about it, right? These guys are just fighting and deciding for themselves who gets what slice of this big old Chinese pie. So the Qing dynasty has to give up a lot of its territory, 
its authority to rule its own land to the Europeans because of the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, going back for a second. So the after the Taiping Rebellion, after the sphere of influence, we see that the Chinese realize that they need to modernize. It's, it's very obvious they need to modernize, they need to industrialize. So they, they come up with this program called the Self-Strengthening Movement. And they say, we're, that's it, no more playing around, we're going to do it, we're super serious about it, and they try to industrialize. And they do. They borrow money from Europe. Uh, they build universities that are based on like European style learning. They build shipyards and railroads and telegraph lines. But it's always kind of like just on the coast, never in the interior, right? So it's only like part, a tiny part of the country. China is huge. It's only a small part industrializes. The part that, of course, are under foreign influence. And the reason why it doesn't spread and the reason why it's not fully adopted is because of the scholar gentry. The scholar gentry doesn't accept Western values. They don't accept Western education. They don't accept Western technological advancements because they think that all of those things are bad. All those things are negative. All those things have a negative influence in Chinese society. China is the Middle Kingdom. China is the wealthiest country in the world and has been for a long time, the most powerful country in the world and has been for a long time. So why change anything? Now, of course, these Confucian scholars who are the elites of Chinese society, right? They're not just looking out for the welfare of China. They're looking out for their own selves because they know that changing up the economy and the government and society is going to put their status, their position, their wealth at risk. So they reject it and they oppose it. And even the emperors, right, the Qing emperors realize, you know what, we shouldn't do it. And they oppose it. So the self-strengthening movement ends up being a big failure. Right? Only small parts of China industrialize. And that's nowhere near enough to remain competitive when the West is rising to more and more power. And again, what's the result is that huge chunks of China come under foreign rule during these spheres of influence. The Chinese, of course, are not happy about this. And again, we see another rebellion. This one becomes known as the Boxer Rebellion. And it is led by this um, organization, this secret organization, known as the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. And they start organizing protests against foreigners. They say that these foreigners are like the devils. They have brought nothing but bad things to China. We need to kick these people out, make China for the Chinese. And they go around city after city targeting European foreign property and destroying it and killing thousands of Europeans and thousands of foreigners as well, you know, Americans, for example and Japanese. So, um, and the, the Qing dynasty, the Qing emperor, uh, is a lady at this point. Her name is Empress, um, Empress uh, Dowager. And Empress Dowager is kind of like secretly supporting the boxers because she wants the foreigners to get out. Uh, so she's not putting, you know, really trying to stop them or anything. So then the foreigners get an army, uh, what we call a multinational force, and they send this military to China to put down the Boxer Rebellion. So we have Chinese boxers versus Americans versus British versus French versus Japanese versus Russians. And all these foreign powers put down the rebellion. And then the foreigners say, okay, China, Qing Dynasty of China, has to pay for all this. You got to pay for the war. You got to pay for the destruction that these people cause. You got to pay for uh, all the people that got killed, right? You got to pay them, you know, a, you know, a reward or whatever for for dying. And um, the end result is Chinese dynasty, the Qing dynasty becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, right? And we see that new, like, uh, in, especially in the interior parts of China, different warlords, like local rulers, decide, you know, Qing Dynasty sucks, we're just going to run things for ourselves. So it, uh, we see more like decentralization of the Qing Dynasty. And this is going to continue in the you know, 1890s into 
uh, the first decade of the 1900s, right? And all the way by 1911, we see that revolutions are going to spread about, uh, spread throughout China, and the Qing Dynasty is finally going to get overthrown. And in its place, a republic will be formed, a nationalist republic will be formed to replace the uh, dynasty, right? So the dynastic cycle that has existed for over 2,000 years in Chinese history is going to come to an end in 1911, right? Just after the end of the modern era. Uh, so we'll talk more in a future chapter about the rise of Chinese nationalism, the creation of a Chinese Republic in a future chapter. So that's it for the story of modern China, of the last and final dynasty, which is the Qing dynasty, and how it comes to kind of like this violent, bloody end, right? China does not industrialize. China does not modernize. China does not westernize. And it brings the downfall of the dynasties. And it brings, eventually, we're going to see in the 20th century, how it's going to bring a lot of problems to um, China during the World Wars. All right, so that is it. Thank you for watching and listening and following along. Hope you liked it. You want to say it one more time? One more time? Let's do it. One more last song. Why not? Here we go. Here we go. You ready? Sing with me. Shang Zhao Qin Han, Shang Zhao Qin Han, Sui Tang Song, Sui Tang Song, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Yuan Ming Qing Republic, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong. All right. That's good enough for today. See you next time.